Well, thank you. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. I, as stated, my name is Zach Herman. Um, I'm going to be discussing a case study that we did in the Buffalo Red River Watershed District where we took the LIDAR information and attempted to use it for stressor identification in terms of placing BMPs on the landscape. Um, I'm going to probably get a little bit more into the nuts and bolts in terms of how we recondition a DEM and some of these stressor identification processes that we use. Uh, I guess my whole goal here is to give you a technical presentation without getting too technical. So if at the end of the day, you know, you guys walk away from this thinking, I kind of get what he did, but I'm not sure how he did it. I think I may have accomplished what, I'm, what I've set out to today. So, so um, this just gives a little bit of background of the project area that we're working in. Um, it's about 160 square miles sub-watershed of the Buffalo River watershed. Uh, for those of you not familiar with the Red Basin, the Buffalo River watershed is about an 1,100 square mile uh, watershed of the Red River Basin, um, right near Moorhead, Minnesota. This particular project was funded through the 2011 Clean Water Fund. Um, and Jerry Van Emberg had actually alluded to this project in his presentation. This is part of a uh, much larger study that the Buffalo Red River Watershed District project team is investigating right now. There are many concerns within this watershed, uh, not just limited to water quality improvement. There is uh, huge flood damage reduction issues within the watershed as well as uh, natural resource enhancement in terms of uh, wetland restorations and that type of thing. Um, now the purpose of this study is to take the GIS data and the LIDAR data and use it as kind of a desktop uh, filter, if you will, in terms of locating high priorities within this 160 square mile watershed for um, targeting and implementing BMPs. Um, you can see that, neck, that bullet there. Um, kind of where we're at right now is we've finished the GIS study and we're just beginning to use the results of that for marketing and implementation of BMPs. Uh, project partners, Buffalo Red River Watershed District was a local sponsor on the grant application. They also partnered with the uh, Wilkin County SWCD as well as the West Ottertail SWCD. And this map here just gives you a little background in terms of uh, where we're actually at in the valley. For those of you familiar, there's Barnesville right there. Uh, Interstate 94 comes up through here. Moorhead would be off up over here someplace. So this little schematic here just describes our workflow for the um, GIS desktop uh, analysis portion of this particular grant. Uh, we're going to kind of quickly work through all these bullets here. The first one you see highlighted in red is the first thing I'm going to talk about, the DEM reconditioning. Now, when we say reconditioning, essentially what we mean is Although LiDAR data is very good at de depicting the, the surface of the Earth, it does have its limitations in terms of developing hydrologic parameters. Um, most notably, where you have roads and things of that nature, LiDAR fails to account for culverts and things that go through those roads at those locations. Um, to correct for that, what's required is um, you have to have a local knowledge of the drainage patterns within that particular watershed. Um, we commonly refer to these roads where there's culverts as digital dams. As if I can figure this thing out here. Um, when we say digital dam, what it does is it artificially would back water up behind that road. So, that one there. All right. Now, this is just an example of what a digital dam actually is in the landscape. This is Interstate 94. It cuts through our project area. You can see the two lanes of traffic. And we know that there's a uh, fairly sizable structure that exists under the road at this location. Um, you can see the browns correlate to low elevations. You work your way up through the yellows to the blues to high elevations. Uh, what the computer would actually interpret this uh, if you didn't go through the reconditioning process would flow would actually accumulate, hit this road, and continue along the road, causing errors in, the, uh, in hydrologic parameters as you move downstream. Now, what we do is we go through these, and somebody actually has to go through and digitize where that culvert is located through the road. And through some GIS processing, we can actually eliminate the road through that location. And what that does is that allows the flow to continue to accumulate downstream, and we get the correct uh, flow accumulations as we move downstream from the interstate here. Now, this slide just illustrates 
how labor intensive and how much work actually goes into reconditioning a DEM. What you're seeing here is this is another effort that was completed in the Red Basin in North Dakota, Minnesota, and portions of South Dakota, where they were going through and reconditioning the entire DEM to um, develop um, hydrologic models for uh, floodplain type analyses. And that, for that particular study, um, there was approximately 140,000 burn lines used across the entire area. Um, if you were to calculate that in terms of burn lines per square mile, you're about oh, eight of those locations per square mile. Um, if you were to compare that to what it actually took for the project we're working on, it was more like uh, double that for, for the effort that was required per square mile. So once the reconditioning is complete, the next step that you see here is a non-contributing analysis. Essentially when we're doing that non-contributing analysis, we're trying to look for areas in the landscape, um, low areas that the LIDAR indicates where there's sufficient storage in that depressed area in the DEM that it wouldn't contribute for a given rainfall event. For our analysis, we were looking at the 10-year, 24-hour rainfall event. Um, these next slides will hopefully make things a little clearer. So what you see here, this red line defines the watershed contributing to this point right here. Um, this little basin that you see located right here is actually a low point in the DEM. Um, if, we're not, if we didn't account for this low point in the DEM and told it that everything was contributing until you got to the drainage divide, this is what your drainage area would look like. However, since we do have the LIDAR information, what we can do is calculate what the contributing area is to this given low point, and we can calculate what the maximum potential storage is of this low point before it would spill out. And when we have those two variables, what we can do is compare the runoff volume produced from our given rainfall event to the available storage within this depressed area and make a determination whether or not it would be contributing downstream. And for the, this particular analysis, especially the stream power index where we're directly using the flow accumulation or the contributing area at this point, um, that can make a big difference in terms of skewing your results by the time you get to your point of analysis. So, Now once we've completed DEM reconditioning and we've gone through the non-contributing analysis, what we do is we take these two pieces and actually tie them together to determine what we call the hydrologically re reconditioned DEM. What that DEM allows us to do is develop um, hydrologic parameters throughout the watershed that analyzes the contributing portion of that watershed for your given um, rainfall scenario. In our case, you know, what this DEM allows us to do is determine hydrologic characteristics at a given point based on what would be contributing for a 10-year, 24-hour rainfall event. Now this map gets a little busy, but what it's trying to illustrate is what you can actually derive once you have a hydrologically reconditioned DEM. You can see these heavy black lines correlate to um, uh, drainage divides or subbasin boundaries. The uh, red correlates to where you have non-contributing areas within each of those subbasins. And the blue correlates to the uh, contributing streams that can be derived directly from the LIDAR information. So once we get through developing the hydrologically reconditioned DEM, and again, this is more of a precursor to the actual stressor identification piece of things that we use to identify where BMP should go on the landscape, we can begin to get into the more of the, the stream power index and Russell spatial analysis. Uh, one thing to make note of is, you know, these three processes, although they're more of an input to your actual analysis that you're performing, are by far the most time and labor intensive uh, portion of your entire study that you do. It takes a significant amount of time to actually go through the DEMs and make a determination where that reconditioning should be applied in the landscape. So the first one of our stressor identification tools that I'd like to discuss is the uh, stream power index. Um, now, what you can see here was similar to the, that last slide that we had looked at, where you have 
your blue lines correlate to flow paths that were um, derived from the hydrologically reconditioned DEM. You have your non-contributing areas highlighted here. And these dark blue lines here actually correlate to what we can consider um, our overland channelized flow areas across the DEM. So for, maybe just to back up a step, for those of you that may not be familiar with what uh, the stream power index is, really what you're doing is you're relating the slope and the, uh, the contributing area at any given point across the landscape to determine what the likelihood of erosion is a, of occurring at that location. So if you have a high drainage area and a high slope, what that would correlate to is a high likelihood of erosion to occur at that spot. Now what we can see on this, this is the actual slope of that particular area that we were looking at. Um, the reds correlate to a higher slope while the blues correlate to a lower slope. And again, with LiDAR information, this can be derived on a gridded basis. What you're seeing here is a generalized slope across a, a three meter by three meter cell within the particular watershed. And since we do have that reconditioned DEM that I alluded to, we can accurately determine how flow would actually accumulate across this particular project area. Now, what you can see is how things are actually accumulating before you get to what we're considering our in-channel area. So when we combine that slope grid that we just looked at along with how things accumulate, we can, we can then rank the likelihood of erosion to occur at a given location um, again, based on the stream power index that we had talked about. What you can see here, the red correlates to areas where you have a higher uh, stream power index value or a higher propensity of erosion to occur at the on the landscape, whereas the green correlates to areas where you'd have a lower propensity for erosion on the landscape. Um, kind of one of the shortfalls of the stream power index is it, it really doesn't take into account some of the land use that's actually occurring out there. So, you know, if you're looking at, for example, let's say this particular piece of land was actually enrolled in CRP or something like that, you would still get these same values because all we're looking is at the physical characteristics of the landscape and not so much the land use of that particular piece of land. And that kind of brings us to the next piece of our analysis where we take a look at the Russell um, the Russell equation, and we try to apply it in more of a spatial setting. Um, I think Pete Young actually did a pretty good job of kind of spelling out maybe some of the fundamentals behind Russell in terms of the input uh, variables that go into it, so I'm not planning on diving too deep into that, but essentially what Russell allows us to do is determine what the sediment loading is due to um, sheet flow across the watershed, due to land use, soil types, and uh, topographic characteristics. Again. What we're doing is aided greatly with the hydrologically reconditioned DEM. It allows us to develop those topographic t characteristics uh, very uh, precisely. Um, in terms of land use, we didn't have the luxury of having quite as robust a land use data set as um, uh, Pete's study did. Um, we actually utilized the 2010 NAS uh, land cover data to to get a handle on what the various land use is out there. As you can see, well maybe you can't see, it's tough to read the legend here, but um, our particular project watershed is very, very intensively ag. Um, approximately 70 to 80 percent of the watershed is currently tilled. And this slide shows some of the soil characteristics. This is, uh, this is derived directly from the Sergo Soils database. This is your um, soil erodibility factor. Um, and again, this is just this is information that's available out there through the USDA that we uh, that we just took for this particular analysis. And in terms of using the hydrologically reconditioned DEM, what Russell uses for topographic characteristics of the of the watershed is what's referred to as the length slope factor. And basically, what that does is it relates the slope to the upstream flow length at a given point. So what we can do is on a gridded basis determine what that length slope factor is per grid cells, what you see here. And you know, if you remember what the uh, slope grid correlated or looked like here, 
you can see when you go back to your length slope factor, it, it somewhat correlates. So, so where you have higher slopes in the landscape, you have um, a higher length slope value. So with Russell, what we're able to do is take all those variables then and tie them together to determine um, what the estimated sediment loading would be on a per grid cell basis. Now, when we performed our Russell analysis, we kept it more to areas where we felt that um, sheet or um, real flow would be occurring and then accumulated those values downstream until we got to our point of interest, which is our blue line or this in-channel waterway here. Uh, we also, you know, attempted to apply a sediment delivery ratio to each of our values on a grid cell basis. Um, and what we utilized was um, a relationship between your outlet point and the flow length to your grid cell that you're analyzing um, to determine what the sediment delivery ratio would be actually reaching your inflow point. Uh, the, the ratio that we use is actually defined out of the Minnesota Phosphorus Index. So. So once we had these two analysis done, what we did is we took the results of those and we actually um, combined them similar to like what the uh, EBI had, had done. So we had taken a look at the stream power index and Russell and looked at them more in a comparative approach and ranked the values against each other. Um, so with Russell, for example, we did a percentile ranking of that um, data set and with the stream power index we did a percentile ranking of that data set and combined the two together on like a 50-50 uh, a weight essentially. Um, idea being there with stream power index we have an index of erosion that can occur at that given point on the landscape and with Russell we have an index for what the like or what the um, potential for sediment loading upstream of that particular point is Idea being, if we can correlate that to a high score, then we have a location where, for BMP implementation, not only maybe we're fixing a problem at that location, but also maybe we can provide some, uh, some uh, um, filtering of, the, of potential loading upstream of that location as well. So on a larger scale, what we had done is we had taken all those values and come up with a mean score per overland catchment. Now when I say overland catchment, that's the contributing area that gets to what we consider our in-channel areas. Um, you can see on this map we have red areas correlate to a high score, greens correlate to a lower score. Um, so what we're planning to use this tool for is work with the SWCDs in terms of marketing BMPs where we can take these catchments and um, pick out ones based on the higher scores for initial landowner contact and marketing of structures. If we don't get um, really good landowner willingness, we'd probably expand that a little bit. Once, uh, once interested landowners are identified, kind of the next thing that we, we would do is approach the landowners with a map similar to what you see here. Um, this is, a, this is a, you know, rather than catchments ranked, it's actually ranked on a gridded basis. You can see as things accumulate downstream until you get to the, the pore point into what's defined as your in-channel area. Um, what we could do is take this to the landowner and um, just say, hey, you know, from what our analysis is showing us, it looks like you have some problem areas here, here, here on your operation and work with them to try and find a workable solution to try and fix some of those problem areas. Um, this, this particular map is a, uh, we had put together kind of a, uh, a base GIS map that the SWCDs could then just pan around in and print it off as needed. We've also done um, a, a, a large set of map books, I guess, for the project area where um, it's, I believe it's about 30 maps that kind of summarize on nine, about nine square miles per map, um, detail similar to this that some of the SWCDs that don't have GIS capabilities can then use to take with them out in the field. So next steps, as I stated, you know, we've finished the GIS analysis at this point, but we're really just getting going on marketing the BMPs. Um, kind of the steps that are going to be taken is the Buffalo Red River Watershed District Office is planning to send out an informational letter 
to all the affected landowners with, well not all the affected landowners, all the landowners within the project area just to make them aware that this particular piece of that larger study is taking place right now. We're going to take the larger scale ranking of those little, uh, those overland catchments that I had referred to and use that for prioritization of landowners to initially contact and then use those smaller scale um, maps for um, meeting with individual landowners. Uh, and then once, you know, once we have willing landowners identified and a plan put in place, the idea would be to actually go out there and implement BMPs on the landscape. The particular grant actually has funding for approximately six sediment control basins across the project area. Um, and again, the analysis could help in uh, some preliminary design of those particular structures. Another thing to note is that Buffalo Red was actually successful in getting another grant for this same analysis for the, um, this year. And what that would do, it would allow us to take this take the analysis that I just described and actually perform it across the entire Buffalo Red River Watershed District, which is approximately 1,300 square miles. Um, some other things that we want to incorporate into that is we'd like to uh, also look at the CTI. Um, when I say CTI, what it really is, is just the inverse of the stream power index, meaning that it relates a flat slope with a uh, high flow accumulation in terms of an area where water could potentially pond. Uh, the reason the Buffalo Red River Excuse me, the, the reason the Buffalo Red River Watershed District is so interested in that is because there is potential for a lot of WRP type funding to come into the Red River Valley and doing what we can to identify those sites ahead of time um, will really make a big difference in, in terms of how much potential funding they could qualify for. And what we want to do with this particular grant is take the results of the analysis and incorporate it into uh, their website so they could then, um, so it would make it easier for some of those SWCDs and that type of thing to go and make their maps and just for the general public to be able to view the results of the analysis through a web-based environment without having to have the GIS software capabilities. So that's kind of a, uh, a real quick blow through. Um, in terms of the actual technical analysis, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie and she's going to talk more about some uh, bigger picture tools that we're using. Okay, thanks, Zach. So I got a lot more credit than I deserved. I, my name was said first, introduced me first, and everything that I made Zach talk for 20 of the 25 minutes. So when, when Pat called and asked us to participate in the presentation today, I thought, you know, it'd be really easy for me to stand up here and show us some of the fantastic things that have been done by Zach and some of the other folks out of our Fargo office. But, and I'm going to do that here next, but I wanted to give him an opportunity to really give some sense of, this, this is a lot of work. So when folks come and they want these tools, they're really fantastic management tools. They give some really nice detailed, like Zach said, they're doing these analyses on three meter by three meter grids. So, 10 foot by 10 foot grids, we've got outputs that help us look at where to actually implement BMPs on the landscape. But again, it's weeks and weeks worth of work of people sitting down and drawing lines in GIS to get us to this point. So it's not, it's not trivial. And what was the cost for the, for the South Branch? So it cost almost $30,000 to do the project that Zach was just showing. So that's also a concern, you know, folks ask, well, great, but how do we afford to do this? So again, that's one of the things I want to touch on a little bit as well as I talk about how I'm trying to take, I, d I work on a lot of our water quality work, lead a lot of our water quality efforts at Houston Engineering, and I want to talk a little bit about how I'm trying to take some of these terrain analysis products and bring them into some of the other projects that we're working on, in particular some of the um, watershed restoration and what's the new acronym? Watershed restoration and protection plans. I don't know if folks are the watershed approach, the watershed wide TMDLs, these projects that are going on. Um, we found that that's a great opportunity to have some funds available to create some of these products. And then I also just want to give a quick heads up to a project that's going to be starting soon where a partnership between Houston Engineering, the International Water Institute, and MCEA to bring some of these train analysis products and put them out, make them publicly available through the Red River Basin Decision Information Network. 
So many of the water quality studies that we work on are on a watershed scale. So Bev talked a little bit about how they had a SWAT model that was created for the area that she works in. We do a lot of SWAT modeling, HSPF modeling. And these tools are fantastic as well. They give us really detailed simulations of exactly what's happening in the area that we're looking at. Good picture of the whole hydrologic cycle. Um, within SWAT, we can actually grow different crops, put in different tillage practices, et cetera. And we can get quantified answers of estimations of how much sediment's gonna come off the landscape in different parts. It, also, how much phosphorus, for example. The problem with that is that it gives us those outputs on a pretty big scale. So we can see, this is in the watershed that Zach was referring to in the Buffalo River watershed, 1,300 square miles. Huge watershed lets us look at, you know, the dark areas are places that we want to really concentrate on for implementing BMPs. Well, when we take the outputs of our SWOT model and couple that with the outputs of our terrain analysis then, we can really start to drill down when we hand these models over at the end of the day to the watershed districts, the SWCD, and say, go out, start knocking on people's doors and trying to get folks to participate in some of your programs. They can use the combination of these two models to say, okay, according to my SWAT model, I've got areas that have high propensity for um, sediment to come off the landscape based on these very detailed simulations, and then within there, I can see, based on my priority rankings, with red being high priority, exactly where I might want to go, again, on this very fine scale. So these are things that we're doing. It's becoming very commonplace for us in a lot of the watershed studies that we're doing to start to write in the terrain analysis products. Again, $30,000 a pop, roughly, whatever. Um, there's funds available that we've been able to pull these things into those studies and leave nice management tools, I think, for the LGUs to look at when they actually need to get to implementation. Maybe that last slide is gone. Um, the last thing I just wanted to point out, because I'm almost out of time here, and I think that it sounded like Jerry maybe talked about it a little bit in his study, or excuse me, his presentation as well, is that as these products are being created, we've got a number of efforts across the Red River Basin that are currently going on where we're creating these train analysis products that are, again, providing these great resources. Most of them are being pre created with public dollars, either through Bowser grants or under MPCA programs, et cetera. And a couple months ago, we were chatting with some of our colleagues over at the International Water Institute and MCEA, and we said, wouldn't it be great if there was a way to let people know that these products are done, they don't have to do them again, they can get their hands on them, and we could make them publicly available. So I wish this slide was still up here, but I don't think it came. So um, there's a poster at the back that alludes to what's happening. Uh, there's a project that's gonna get started here in the next year to do exactly that. So the Red River Basin Decision Information Network is an online, publicly available tool, or a website, I should say, that has a number of different things in it. Some folks may have gone there and downloaded LIDAR data, for example. That's one thing that you can get off the site. We're going to create a similar interface to where you can go and download that LIDAR data and post all of the terrain analysis products that are being created in the Red River Basin there as well. So that's similar to how you can go and look at and download LIDAR data. You'll be able to look at and download those terrain analysis products. So. I think that'll be a really nice thing for folks that are in that area in the state, and hopefully we'll see that happening in other areas of the state as these products are created. So I'm done. Stephanie and Zach, uh, with as big an issue as wind erosion is, and those sediments being deposited in that surface drainage network, uh, have you guys thought about, or are you looking at using some of this technology to look at wind erosion deposition and then that stream power index to see those areas where maybe you get that big first flush in the spring? Hmm. So the question was about wind erosion 
and how that plays in to all of this, I think. Yeah, so I mean, some of the more mechanistic models like SWAT, they try to simulate wind erosion as well and look at how that might get deposited. You know, the terrain analysis, the approaches that are being used, they don't look at wind erosion, but certainly they're looking at areas that you would have, if you could somehow aggregate your watershed into areas that have higher potential to have those sediments deposited and then through the SPI values or something you could then say okay we've got higher areas of deposition here and then these are the areas where we know that they'll be eroded more likely. Are you trying to look at channel erosion at all uh, other than through the SPI or is it I don't, is SWAT use, uh, approaching the channel? Channel erosion, or how are you dealing with that? Yeah, channel erosion is definitely a challenge. Um, you know, again, some of these mechanistic models try to go, they, they don't have great ways to simulate channel erosion. They have some capabilities built into them. We are creating an HSPF model in the Buffalo River watershed right now, and that has a little more ability to do it. It does a better job with routing through the channel and whatnot, but I mean, that's consistently a, a challenge, is really explicitly nailing that down. Not to mention we just don't really have a lot of good data to even, empirical data to even support trying to tease that out at this point, in the Red River Valley at least. Sort of a, a quick two part, <coughs> thanks, very nice presentation. Um, one would be, as we saw Dr. Mull's presentation this morning, he contrasted the cost of understanding this part of the world by walking out there and doing it by hand versus the intensity of some of the digital work you did. So sort of what's the cost? I can get kind of lost in the complexities of actually, you know, uh, rationalizing the digital data compared to doing that. So just a sense of, of what are we talking about in terms of organizational resources. Second part, maybe more importantly, how finely do we need to target this kind of understanding of the world to in fact get conservation values on the ground? So two-part question, uh, one about costs and costs of doing it with train analysis via GIS, for example, versus boots on the ground, walk around, look at your watershed. And the second one, the spatial resolution, yeah. Sure, so again, I mean, South Branch, it costs about $30,000 to do this analysis in GIS. You know, once you identify those priority zones, like what Stephanie was talking about with the, you know, you identify at your HUC 12 scale or whatever it is where your priority needs to be placed, what these analysis really allow us to do is go through, okay, within that particular 20 or 30 or 50 square miles, whatever it may be, where do we really want to focus within that, within that area? Um, in terms of, I'm not sure if you were alluding to maybe like truth checking the, the analysis or anything, but yeah. I, I, to me, that's where the benefit really shines is where, it, like what Stephanie alluded to, where you have a sub-watershed that you know is a problem area. Now, where do we work within that sub-watershed when we're talking about practices that maybe practically can only, you know, control 40 acres of drainage area, for example, you know, across the 50 square miles? Where can we place that to get the best benefit? One thing I'll say about this, too, is so when we did this in the Buffalo, it was part of a pilot study for... Um, the MPCA's new watershed approach. And so they had us look at doing the desktop stressor ID analysis is what they called it. And then they put actually people in the field and went out and looked at, desk, uh, looked at stressors in the field as well. So there's certainly pros and cons to both. The idea with doing it from the desktop was to say, this alleviates us having to send people on the ground, which is gonna be way more time intensive to physically walk that whole watershed. At the same time, we also know that by using, you know, the train analysis approach through the GIS, we don't know, you know, we can look at this much water drains to this point, this is the slope of that point. We don't necessarily know, does somebody have a uh, side inlet there or is there already a BMP in place there? So this helps us to just target where to actually go look. Secondly, even if somebody is out and they're walking along, a lot of what we're picking up here is gullies. So if they're walking along and it's just after a farmer went out and plowed their field, they're not gonna see that that's an area that would have 
a gully formation because it's hidden versus the GIS analysis helps us to see it based on physical properties that we know it's quite likely to be there. So again, it's kind of, it, you want both <laughs> is what it comes down to. As far as spatial resolution is concerned, we're currently doing things on a three meter grid and as part of this project that we're gonna be um, working on and that Henry's recently been working on, MCEA and NRCS have started looking at what, what scale do you need to have that on? We've got hydrologically corrected DEMs that have been created for other purposes, but they're on a five meter grid scale. And the question is, well, is that good enough? Can we pick those up then and then just use them to compute our SPIs or are we losing some of the value by having it on a bigger grid scale? One more thing in terms of cost there, you know, I had alluded to just under 30,000 is what it costs us to perform this analysis. But one thing to keep in mind is a large chunk of that dollar amount goes to actually reconditioning the DEM itself. And there are a lot of other uses for that DEM. You know, I alluded to that this is a lot larger project area for the Buffalo Red and that DEM now that was used or developed as part of this project is now being used to help identify more like flood damage reduction type projects and analyze those type projects. So, so the DEM really does serve multiple, or multiple uses once you do have it created. So 